All right, hello everybody, and thank you again for joining us for this uh, Wells Fargo Regional Foundation um, webinar. Um, the topic today that we're going to be talking about is opportunity zones. Um, this is a topic that that many of you have have mentioned to us is something that you're interested in that you're hearing a lot about in your cities and in your communities. And so we're really excited today uh, to be joined by Bruce Katz, director of the NOAC Metro Finance Lab at Drexel University, um, and he's going to talk to us today about opportunity zones, how they're driving uh, new systems of community development. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce Katz and, and let him take it away. Okay, well, thanks to uh, Wells Fargo and to Policy Map for hosting this. And so what I'm going to try to do is get through this uh, presentation um, quickly so that we really could focus on some back and forth. Um, so obviously, opportunity zones uh, are a, a new kind of vehicle for tax advantage capital uh, in a very large number of low-income census tracts in the United States. Um, I think what, what I'm finding with a group of colleagues around the country is that they have the potential not only to catalyze a whole bunch of projects uh, that might be investor-ready and community-enhancing, uh, but help us imagine a different system not just around community development, but community wealth building. So let me sort of walk through this. So what do we need to know? Um, I, I think many of you have probably been exposed uh, to tax attorneys or, or other describing um, how opportunity zones work. Uh, we don't need to spend too much time on the details. Um, this is a different kind of tax incentive uh, that is focusing on deferring reducing or even eliminating capital gains taxes uh, as a means to uh, either entice local capital or national capital, uh, a different class of investors uh, to actually in, invest in a very wide variety of projects in low-income neighborhoods. Um, obviously, the New York Times and others, um, because there are no real guardrails on this and no reporting requirements, have tended to focus on uh, the ugly part of the good, bad, and ugly um, of what this tax incentive might ultimately do. Um, but what I'm seeing around the country uh, is, for the first time, uh, networks of, of a different class of investors, um, could be corporations, uh, could be high net worth individuals, uh, looking at investments in, in designated census tracts, low income census tracts, uh, in a very different way than they might have done in the past. So, you know, there's there's a long game to this. We're in early innings right now, and I don't think we're actually even in the first inning. Um, so, uh, you know, this this incentive is is being understood and ultimately is going to get deployed in some very interesting ways. Um, as I said before, uh, the, the, there are a lot of zones. The governors were given uh, the the authority to designate a quarter of census tracts that are eligible for the new market tax credit incentive, which many on the, this webinar probably are familiar with. Um, so if you compare it to empowerment zones, you know, um, the sort of tax incentive du jour in the early 1990s, there were only six empowerment zones that were authorized by federal law, ultimately uh, through a lot of machinations. I think we designated uh, 12 at the time. There are 8,762 zones. So as I go through this presentation, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is how we begin to bring some routine to the market uh, to communicate assets, identify advantages, ultimately go the last mile to get the projects. So we're not in a needle in the haystack kind of phenomenon uh, where those with capital gains somehow are, are 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 forced to find those investable projects in different parts of the country. Um, there's, so there's about six trillion dollars of unrealized capital gains in the U.S. Uh, depending on what happens with market gyration, <laughs> which is a daily basis. Um, there were predictions early on that this would potentially unlock a hundred billion dollars in equity capital. Um, which is quite substantial. And obviously, this would just be uh, tax advantage capital that is incented by this um, tax provision. So that would leverage up, depending on the deal, a substantial amount of conventional debt, public incentives, concessionary capital. So as we think about 
the kind of projects um, that communities want and that investors ultimately might invest in. It's not just potentially 50 billion or 75 billion or 100 billion of market-oriented equity. It's how that equity becomes part of a capital stack and leverages up substantial amount of philanthropic and, and public uh, incentives. So um, this is quite different, I mean, than anything we've seen before. Low-income housing tax credit, new market tax credit, historic preservation tax credit. Um, this is much more open-ended, much more flexible, uh, and is going to require Wikipedia-like norms and models to be uh, created in the country. Now, if you look at the average poverty rate, unemployment rate, or average family income, uh, in general, with 8,762 zones, the governors chose well. Obviously, there are a bunch of zones because of the lag in census data uh, that should not have been selected to tell you the truth, but those are a very, very, very small portion. Um, for the most part, I've probably been to more zones than any other person in this country because I'm masochistic. And um, I have to say that what I see around the country is well-selected, high poverty in many parts of the country, high vacancy, low business demand, uh, that really forces us to rethink what economic development is. So about 18 months ago, Accelerator for America, which is an intermediary formed by uh, Eric Garcetti, the mayor of Los Angeles, asked Jeremy Nowak, uh, the founder of the Reinvestment Fund, and myself to invent what we were calling an investment prospectus. And this was a tool for cities or counties or even states to um, communicate the assets and advantages in general of their uh, economies drill down into their zones and ultimately go the last mile to identify projects that were investor ready or and community enhancing so there are about 43 cities um, or metropolitan areas uh, and a few states kansas just put out its own opportunity zone investment prospectus uh, that have that have basically uh, risen to the occasion to create this tool around information um, so the market can begin to routinize. Uh, I think up, we'll have upwards of 75 or 100 places that ultimately do this. Um, and uh, we put out an investment prospectus guide so that you could do this at home if you want, uh, either with the help of consultants or frankly, without consultants. Um, I think there's actually quite a bit of um, of positive uh, impact to have a place, a public sector, municipal government, county government, philanthropy, corporate sector, community organizations together design a prospectus because it creates a consensus on reality of what your assets are and ultimately organizes stakeholders in many uh, beneficial ways. So here's a couple um, uh, observations from the first batch in Louisville, South Bend with Mayor Pete, Oklahoma City with Mayor Holt, uh, Stockton with Mayor Tubbs, and uh, Erie, Pennsylvania with Mayor Schember were the first five. So here's a couple observations. Um, first, building on what I said before, um, the prospectus tool does enable uh, an organizing process. And this is a group of logos from organizations in Kansas City that came together uh, to design their own investment perspective. So this is, an, this is not just an information exercise, and it's definitely not a report. It's really meant to be an investment platform. And if you bring together all these different stakeholders, A, you can get this consensus on reality. B, you can begin to source either entrepreneurs and developers who are either working in opportunity zones or have business propositions for zones and actual projects. And then you begin to identify the different part of the capital stack, so to speak, whether it's CRA, Community Reinvestment Act debt, whether it's the city owning land or a church owning land that could sell that land um, for a dollar, let's say, or lease it for a dollar um, and de-risk the deal, so to speak, so that market-oriented capital could come in. I mean, this, this prospectus tool enables disparate players to come around the same table. Uh, and frankly, as I've gone around the country and I've seen places like Birmingham or Erie or Dayton or uh, the early groups that we were working with do this, 
um, it does lead to a different vision of what economic development might actually look like, and then the specificity and granularity of real investable projects. Uh, to do this, this map was put up at an investor summit that Accelerator for America hosted in Stanford, uh, Stanford University in Palo Alto. Uh, at the time, we had about 30 cities that had investment prospectuses. Some of them are small, you know, industrial cities like Erie, Pennsylvania, only 98,000 people, what we would call a weak market former industrial city. Other are cities like Louisville, uh, Kentucky or Oklahoma City, uh, you know, markets that are performing well but are not overly hot except in portions of their geography. And then we have places like San Jose, um, obviously, which are more high-flying, uh, where gentrification and price appreciation in the real estate market is, is, is quite dramatic. So without really any attempt to um, uh, ensure that there was a diversity of markets in urban, suburban, and rural, uh, essentially people, stakeholders, raised their hand in a variety of markets with different kind of perspectives to, to use this tool. At the end of the day, uh, markets want routine. Uh, they want routine in terms of data uh, around the assets and advantages of particular places. And actually what they want are typologies of zones and then prototypes of deals. That's how markets get created. They create asset classes. They create investment sectors. So Jeremy Nowak uh, and Ken Gross and myself created a first version of a typology where all we did, I mean, this is really simple stuff, is we looked at the ratio of jobs to residents in, in different opportunity zones. And if you were over a certain level of jobs to residents, let's say three, that would essentially identify central business districts as employment centers. If you went down to a lower level, you probably would start hitting medical districts where hospitals are located or university districts or industrial districts. Um, and then ultimately you get to a variety of residential communities, some that still have commercial corridors or some economic function if they're near downtowns and others which are basically bedroom. So we were trying to tease out these categories, these typologies of zones, because ultimately that then dictates the kind of projects that would ultimately, you know, um, naturally occur, organically occur in those places. And in about a couple, a few weeks, maybe three weeks, we'll be putting out um, the governance project, Accelerator for America, Drexel. We'll be putting out our first look at um, zones that have high levels of employment related to residents. And those tend to be main streets and municipal airports uh, to really sum it up. And I think this is gonna be quite helpful to the market and to communities. Uh, to figure out how to leverage this tool. Um, the last mile is absolutely critical. I mean, again, this is not a, a think tank report. This is meant to be an investment prospectus, uh, both on the uh, supply side of capital and the demand side of projects. And this is these are four projects east of Troost in Kansas City, the historic black community uh, in Kansas City. Uh, one is the redevelopment of a hospital. Another one is a purpose-built community, if you're familiar with that kind of model. Uh, there's historic city-owned buildings that are getting uh, re regenerated, revitalized, renovated for mixed use. And then there's a group called Movement KC, which has a really interesting idea in these former urban renewal areas or areas that were devastated by highway expansion for radical infill of single-family homes. And so these are shovel-ready, investor-ready projects around the, uh, the you know, 18th and Vine area, a mile radius of uh, east of Troost area in Kansas City. And ultimately, if a prospectus is going to be something that catalyzes investment, getting to this granularity on deals and granularity on capital stacks is absolutely critical. Final piece, and this is from Erie. Um, if we want to do deals that obviously have inclusive outcomes, uh, there's going to have to be some public skin in the game, not just the federal tax incentive, but some kind of uh, subsidy mechanism, whether it comes from tax abatements, TIFs, um, sale of land, as I talked about before, uh, 
or on the business side, some kind of lending or equity uh, investment tool. So Erie, um, you know, has been really ahead of the game in thinking through how to make transparent their suite of incentives locally and then uh, align them with deals as they emerge. So in terms of next steps, um, a couple next steps, and then you know what we should really do is get into uh, Q and A portion of this thing. Um, we think at Accelerator for America, Drexel, that the investment prospectus tool should be ubiquitous. Uh, this should be the uniform tool by which communities, whether it's a city, whether it's a county, whether it's a suburban municipality, whether it's a state, um, basically identify not just in general assets and advantages. Um, but but real projects in their in their places and begin to get to a point where we can understand what's that mix of debt subsidy equity concessionary capital uh, for a housing project versus a commercial real estate project versus fiber infrastructure yada yada so we we really think that this tool is not just about an opportunity zones it's around economic development and community wealth building building more broadly. Um, we think there could be a major data dividend for cities that are able uh, to unveil market potential and, and particularly think about the leveraging effect by disposition of publicly owned assets or nonprofit owned assets. So when you go into many low income communities in the United States, uh, what is striking not you know, surprising to anyone on this phone, given the foreclosure crisis and depopulation and decentralization over the past umpty ump decades. But what's striking is how much the government owns uh, in these places and how much nonprofits, particularly churches own. And ownership of assets in places that have low business demand and high vacancy has not really been seen as a wonderful thing. But if you're actually trying to get deals done um, and you can think about uh, the sale or leasing of land or buildings as part of the capital stack and deals, uh, this can be uh, quite helpful and quite transformative. So the U.S. for the most part, because government is so fragmented, any given city, the general purpose government, the land banks, the ports, the airports, the convention centers, the stadia, the redevelopment authorities, we love our government in the U.S. We got lots of it, and we haven't really come up with a tool yet for showing, displaying, and then acting on ownership of assets. But this Opportunity Zone um, incentive, and this was obviously an indirect effect, no one really thought about this, could, could really reward places that get their shit together, so to speak. Um, there, there is uh, an interesting process that we've been using in a couple places. Everyone on the phone is probably familiar with the Urban Land Institute charrette that they do around placemaking, you know, how to think through the spatial fabric of a downtown or a low-income community. Um, Accelerator for America and Drexel have been using a financing charrette, um, and this works very well. This is Norfolk, Virginia, looking at the St. Paul's area where you had three public housing projects, 230 acres, they got a choice neighborhood grant for one of the projects. How do we look at a particular vision of a deal? Um, could be public housing transformation, could be a broader neighborhood revitalization, you know, and do the math in new and novel ways. So, you know, if, if, the, if the cost of doing the renovation of an older public housing project and doing it in such a way that we upgrade skills of local residents, expand minority-owned businesses, so we actually understand what the cost of this is. Again, how do we put together different blends of public, private, and civic capital so we can actually get the deal done? So that's the financing charrette. Um, it's really just using uh, the mechanisms that have been perfected by the placemaking community and, and moving it over into the financial world. You know, one thing that has been clear, um, you know, was clear to Jeremy Nowak and I when we were writing the new localism um, plug for the book, um, um, but was that what really matters for um, sustainable transformative impact in urban regeneration are institutions 
that have capacity, capital, and community standing. Um, on the real estate side, if people on the phone are familiar with Cincinnati's Center City Development Corporation, a great example of an institution that has driven the redevelopment of Over the Rhine, uh, an, an area adjacent to the downtown of Cincinnati since the early part of the century. The Enterprise Center is an intermediary in West Philadelphia that ha for 40 years has been identifying, mentoring, supporting, capitalizing Black-owned businesses and trying to build them to scale. So institutions really matter. One of the reasons Erie is so far ahead on the Opportunity Zone front is they created a downtown development corporation, capitalized it with patient money from Erie Insurance Company and some of the foundations. They were able to acquire a whole bunch of strategic properties in the core of the downtown. And then you can leverage up market-oriented equity for the renovation of properties. So if you all don't have an institution with capacity, capital, and community standing, the US doesn't lack for capital. What we really lack for are these 21st century kind of intermediaries um, that can use patient capital uh, to design, finance, and deliver transformation. Last bit um, is to think about broader outcomes, not just inclusive outcomes, but outcomes around clean energy, uh, outcomes around reducing health disparities. About a third of the opportunity zones in the United States uh, either have a hospital or are within a half a mile of a hospital. Most of those hospitals are nonprofit institutions. So the question of how they think about their build out and the reducing of health disparities in their adjoining neighborhoods, um, you know, they may not be the, uh, the institutions pulling together an opportunity fund, but they could be working with the private sector uh, on a whole range of interesting uh, propositions. In many hospital districts in the United States, because of the way we built them back in the 40s and the 50s, there is literally no housing um, uh, near the hospitals for medical workers or for others. Um, you know, some of these hospital districts are probably the most unhealthy places to be in the country, which is a bit of irony since, you know, they're supposed to be geared to making people healthy. But in any event, we there is a moment here where we could rethink those areas around hospitals and healthcare institutions for these broader impacts. Um, happy to talk through that as well. So thank you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you can find a lot of this on Twitter, LinkedIn, our website at Drexel, website at Accelerator for America, but happy to answer any and all questions. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. Um, we've had a couple questions already come in, um, but if folks have questions, we're going to spend the next 15 minutes or so um, doing a little bit of Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, like I mentioned earlier, please type them into the box. It should be on the right sort of upper part of your screen, the questions box. Type them in there. I'll see them on our screen. We'll kind of collect them and, and go through them. Um, so I've got a couple questions already. I'm going to go through those. If we don't get to your question uh, today, um, we'll make sure we, we follow up and answer those. Uh, so Bruce, first question, um, and actually I think I can answer this. Uh, where can we find you know this, this presentation, some of these resources that you've been talking about? Um, so let me first answer, then you can answer. So first, this webinar, like I mentioned, we're going to record it, and we'll email it out to everybody. Um, I also think, personally, I found the, um, the NOAC Metro Lab Finance website to be really, really useful. And actually, that website is up on your screen right now, drexel.edu backslash Novak uh, dash lab. Um, but are there other places, Bruce, you'd recommend that people go to sort of read about this, other reports, things like that? Yeah, so everything on the Drexel website um, is also put up on the Accelerator for America website. So that's www.acceleratorforamerica.org. I also have a new localism website uh, that Jeremy and I built called www.thenewlocalism.com. If you go up there, what you'll find is I write a newsletter every two weeks, um, not exclusively about Opportunity Zones, but a lot around a lot of the issues that we're talking about. And um, you could subscribe to the newsletter, it's free. Uh, also, if anyone ever wants to find me, just you know, send me an email or find me on LinkedIn, you'd be surprised how much I actually respond to stuff. Um, I probably should stop doing that. But anyway, 
those are different sources. Great. <laughs> um, so everyone's going to start emailing you now, when, and you'll have to deal with that. Um, so uh, second question, I'm, I'm summarizing from a, a couple of people here, but can you can you talk about any examples you've seen or or maybe uh, ways that you've seen sort of residents engage in this this process and, and not necessarily residents who are going to be investors in Opportunity Zones, but residents who live in some of these communities. What, what role are they playing in developing the prospectus or helping uh, sort of guide that process? So when we did the Kansas City prospectus, and I would highly recommend people, you know, Google Kansas City Opportunity Zone Investment Prospectus, um, the Kauffman Foundation and the Urban Neighborhood Initiative, which is a part of the regional bank chamber, actually, interesting, um, basically provided funding um, for community engagement. And so that was unbelievably helpful because what we were able to get were focus groups of residents who were able to articulate, here are the kind of projects that we would very much like to see in our neighborhood. Now, this is the area, um, you know, a very broad area east of Troost, right? So it's, you know, not exclusively African-American, but it's very largely African-American. And, and it actually is emblematic of many parts of the country that either were urban renewal areas or were areas that were targeted for high, highway expansion. So there's a crazy amount of vacancy. You know, enormous amount of buildings were torn down over time. Enormous numbers of people were displaced. And what has emerged in terms of the local economy is a lot of big box retail, suburban like, um, you know, strip, mo strip malls, and, um, and then the typical predatory parasitic stuff you see in a lot of cities like check cashing, predatory lenders, and so forth. And I think. What was very interesting going through the Kansas City experience was how much local residents were saying, we would like more information about how we can start a business, A, and B, we would like mechanisms for sharing in the wealth of, of the community as value is created from Opportunity Zone investments. So actually what's happening in some really interesting ways, catalyzed by Opportunity Zone investment, but may not be using Opportunity Zone investment, are a set of accelerators around the country that are helping to teach local residents how to become real estate developers and starting small, you know, a single family renovation, for example. And the other thing that's happening, and this is particularly true in North Philadelphia and North Kensington area with a group called Shift Capital, working with an NGO called Impact Services, is to tease out the notion of a neighborhood trust where properties that were, are purchased and renovated um, by a for-profit or non-profit firm are ultimately transferred to the ownership of a community intermediary. And that community intermediary over time can deploy the revenues generated by value appreciation for whatever the community prioritizes. It might be preservation of affordable housing in one community. It might be early childhood in a different community. It might be dealing with some of the uh, health issues. North Kensington is like the epicenter of the opioid crisis in the United States. So resident engagement, I think, is um, tried and true method in many parts of the country. What's more interesting to me about this stuff is how we get accelerators and new new ownership mechanisms uh, to actually build wealth on multiple ways. Excellent, and we, we've gotten a, a, a avalanche of new questions. So um, we, we are gonna try to keep this to sort of, uh, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. So I, as I mentioned before, if we don't answer your question here, We'll definitely try to follow up um, and we will be Crack sending out down. <laughs> yeah, yeah you've got bruce's email just email all times a day can we get your phone number uh no but we will try to follow up and we will be sending out these slides this presentation um and i, I do highly recommend uh checking out the drexel.edu NOAC lab website for a lot of sort of opportunities on one-on-one -on -one -on -one resources that would be really helpful um so next question here and, and again I'm, I'm sort of summarizing a couple questions but are there any examples of rural areas or smaller communities that um, 
you visited or you've heard about that you think are doing this really well that might be an example some of our our um, our grantees should look into or explore more yeah so for smaller urban communities i would say you know erie pennsylvania is the poster child for opportunity zones i mean i i've i've not seen another place in the united states where the public sector the mayor the county executive all the different public authorities the private sector the chamber the major anchor institutions um, like Erie Insurance or UPMC has a major healthcare facility. The universities like Gannon University, the innovation sector, there's an innovation district um, around the downtown philanthropic center like the Community Foundation. Uh, everyone has come together with Erie, in Erie to basically say, we have got to use this tax advantage capital in a way to regenerate the core of our city and metropolis, the downtown. If you've ever been to Erie, it's a beautiful, you know, post-Civil War downtown, um, which, you know, for decades has been basically abandoned. Um, and if you look at the over the Rhine model in Cincinnati, there is a, you know, tried and true method for how you can regenerate at scale using patient capital investment around a development corporation to leverage up private sector equity and private sector debt. So Erie is unbelievably organized um, and organized in a way where clearly they want to regenerate the economy, grow the economy, but also have inclusive outcomes. And they're working through this, I think, in very imaginative um, and creative ways. And their investment prospectus is highly worth reading. They also have an investment prospectus 2.0, uh, which is not out yet, but where they're looking at how federal dollars um, might be able to uh, leverage, be part of transactions. And I think when that comes out, it'll, it'll really send some signals to the national government about what the hell they do, uh, besides just enacting a tax incentive. Um, on the rural side, you know, this gets to the typology questions. Rural areas like urban neighborhoods are not remotely monolithic. There are rural areas that, um, you know, obviously are part of ecotourism or leisure activity, ski resorts, for example, or obviously play a part in food to market in the agriculture sector. So the same kind of intentionality that has to be brought to urban, whether it's a city or a county, has to be brought to rural. Now, many rural areas are actually part of metropolitan areas, so they're part of supply chains, and particularly if they're around airports or near airports, there's a lot of logistics and manufacturing that can take place. Kansas has the first statewide prospectus out. I would highly recommend you take a look at that because it'll show you how these zones in a state level run from urban core suburban, exurban, rural within metro to non-metropolitan. So Colorado is probably the best example of a place where they've actually seen activity in non-metropolitan zones. That was because John Hickenlooper was governor, was early, early on understood what this tax advantage capital could mean. A bunch of funds have been created. The governance project, if you Google the governance project, is run by a woman named Stephanie Copeland, who used to be the director of economic development for Governor Hickenlooper. Uh, she's been very involved in fund formation in rural areas. So, um, you know, basically the, the playbook is quite similar, actually, from the from uh, you know creating transparent information about market potential across all these disparate kinds of zones. But rural areas do have their own character to them. They're very large at land mass, which which ultimately uh, you know, forces this kind of precise market analytics. Great, and, and this is a great time to mention a resource that all of you have available um, to figure out where near or in your communities uh, the Opportunity Zones are located, which is um, on Policy Map. If you go there, you'll be able to see where all the Opportunity Zones in the country are located. That's that's loaded in there as a layer. Um, so that's a, that's a great resource that everyone has access to. Um, you mentioned uh, organization being one of the sort of key advantages that, that some communities have for doing this well. Um, I wonder if you could talk about who is sort of leading the charge, if, if there is one type of person or organization that's leading that organizing uh, role. 
Well, I think the great thing about the United States is we don't really have like a one way of doing anything because we're, you know, we're a federal republic and a lot of power is distributed across multiple sectors. So, you know, my view is like anyone with a pulse can lead this, you know, and it just depends on, uh, you know, who understands the potential of this tax incentive. And again, the tax incentive is just part of the capital stack. It doesn't solve all problems. I mean, you got to start with a vision. You, you got to start with the what. Uh, you know, what kind of project, you know, do you, you know, is all either already underway or, or could, you know, basically built on the assets and advantages of different geographies. The, the tax incentive is part of the how, you know, to get it to fruition. So, the mayors in some places are driving this, uh, chambers are driving this, um, uh, philanthropies in some communities are enabling it. Um, I think universities and health districts in some places are pulling different stakeholders around. Obviously, community networks, whether they're CDFIs or others, are, are you know can be part of this. Um, so bottom line is there's no substitute for both doing the, the data and analytics and trying to organize disparate groups of stakeholders. As to who actually leads, I'm fairly agnostic. It's whoever really um, feels a burning desire to do this. Great. I think we have time for so one, one or two more questions. Um, so we've, we've had a couple questions around this theme, but you know, we, you mentioned the lack of guardrails being something that's been built into this uh, process. Are you aware of any states or municipalities that have attempted to institute their own sort of guardrails or parameters to restrict unwanted or inappropriate development? Yeah, I, so to some extent, actually, the lack of guardrails, um, you know, might be helpful in some ways. I mean, I, 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 there was a reporting requirement in the Investing and Opportunity Act which is the legislation that was essentially incorporated in the 2017 tax law that uh, Senator Booker and Senator Scott co-sponsored. So at the very beginning, uh, Senator Scott and Booker wanted reporting, but because of some procedural nonsense in the tax law, it was kicked out. Um, there's two ways of responding to this, right, at a minimum. A, the market create norms, right? So. Uh, the Kresge Foundation, for example, provided some guarantees to leverage up Opportunity Zone capital, um, and and those funds that were basically encouraged by the Kresge guarantee have to basically conform to some reporting requirements. Anytime a public subsidy touches a project, there is going to be reporting. So depending on how much public subsidy ultimately, whether it's tax abatements, TIFs, sale of land, yada, yada, it's, I mean, then we're going to have reporting. So uh, the, the other thing I would say is the Beak Center at Georgetown with some of the Impact Investor Alliance put together what I thought was a very helpful reporting framework that any community could adopt. Um, you know, a lot of what has to happen here is sort of ears to the street, right? You know, you got to, the more you're organized locally, the more you're going to hear about deals as they occur. And most of these deals are going to be single project transactions or transactions really fueled by local wealth, you know, not some fund sitting in Silicon Valley, but local capital that's really um, being reinvested locally. So there's been a lot of focus on the lack of reporting. I would say that the positive side of this compared to, let's say, the low income credit or the star credit is this is forcing a more holistic, integrated look at economies and ultimately um, asking us to ask, uh, answer some questions, basic questions about business demand and particularly minority owned businesses as a fuel for growth going forward. So let's not get too completely fixated on this. Let's correct for the reporting gap and then really use this uh, tax incentive you know, to its maximum potential. Great. Well, again, Bruce, I, I know we're out of time, but um, on behalf of the Wells Fargo Regional Foundation, uh, Policy Map Reinvestment Fund, we really just want to thank you again for joining us today, uh, sharing you know all of your insights about opportunity zones and what's happening. It's been incredibly useful.